Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. This is the fifth video in the series on Smith charts and the fourth of the Foundations videos. To many people familiar with the Spirograph toy, the Smith chart looks like something that could have been created by it. For those who have never experienced this toy, it looks like a bunch of lines and curves with numbers and all this all over the place. I mean, it, it just kind of makes the eyes glaze over and, and confusion sets in. What do I do with this thing? In either case, it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to most people who are not familiar with it. Well, in this video, I will walk through a tour of the Smith chart. I will identify each of the basic lines and curves and describe what they are and how they're used. This is not intended to be an exhaustive tour of everything on the chart, just those things that the average experimenter would need to know. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe to the channel. So, let's jump on, onto the tour bus and go through the Smith chart. And so now we embark on the guided tour of the Smith chart. I want you to understand all the little pieces and parts and stuff and things that make up the Smith chart so that it becomes a useful tool to you. So let's begin with understanding that we have normalized values here. Well, what on earth exactly is a normalized value? Well, let's take an example here. If your impedance is 100 plus J25, so you have the real part of 100, you have the reactive or imaginary part of 25, and the characteristic impedance, Z sub zero, that's a, a normal reference to the characteristic impedance of a system. So if you're looking at uh, materials about this stuff, Z zero, is the characteristic impedance of the system of your coax or whatever. Let's just say that it is 50 ohms. Then what you do is you take the, the real portion and you divide it by the characteristic impedance of the system. And then you take the reactive portion here, 25. 25 divided by the characteristic impedance of the system. And so you get a normalized impedance, a Z sub N, of 2.0 plus J0.5. And so you would plot on the Smith chart 2.0 plus J0.5. And you say, well, why on earth do they do that? Well, that is so that the Smith chart can be used with any transmission line. If you're dealing with 75 ohm transmission line, then you're dividing by 75. If you're dealing with a 93 ohm transmission line, well, you divide by 93. It makes it so the Smith chart can be used with any transmission line that you happen to be working with. The next thing to notice here is the resistive portion of it. Now, notice we have little circles all grounded to this side, and these circles emanate around and around and around and around and around and around, and they get bigger and bigger. This is where you plot your resistive portion of your impedance. And so, with our example here, if your normalized impedance is Z sub N is equal to 2.0 plus J0.5, then this 2.0 portion, the real portion or the resistive portion, would be plotted on this circle right here. Now we've got the resistive part. What about the reactive part? Well, the reactive part is plotted on these and these are actually also circles, by the way. It's just that their center is way out here in space somewhere. But they are circles. And each one successively larger and larger and larger and larger. Or if we're going over here, smaller and smaller and smaller. 
Everything north of the equator here is the inductive reactants plus Jx. Everything south of the equator down here is capacitive reactants or minus Jx. So what about our example? Well, if our normalized impedance Z sub n is 2.0 plus J 0.5, to begin with, we look and we see that this is a plus. That tells us that whatever we're going to do, we're going to be plotting it on the northern hemisphere up here. And it's a 0.5. So we look along here, we see 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, Ah, here's 0.5, and this line here is the plus J 0.5 line. So when we're talking about this impedance then, where these circles, the resistance circles, intersect the reactive circles is where it's plotted. So in this case, 2.0 plus J 0.5 Here's our 2.0 circle here. Here's our plus J 0.5. And so we follow that up. And right here, this is where the impedance gets plotted on, on this Smith chart for this particular impedance. Now, there's another set of circles that aren't actually on the Smith chart, but you will be putting them on the Smith chart. There's what are called the SWR circles. When its center is at the normalized impedance of 1 plus 0J, which is right here, right in the center. And the SWR around this circle is the same. It's a constant. So, what do you do with this then? Well, you can read your SWR right off of the Smith chart here. So, you take your, your impedance, let's say Z sub n equals 1 plus 0.7 J. You plot that here. So, if you look, this is the 1.0 is this circle right here. And... 0.7, that's this line that comes right down here, so we plot it right there. We then take out our compass, we draw our SWR circle, and then we follow this circle down to where it crosses the equator, and then we can read the SWR right off of the chart here. In this case, it is an SWR of 2 to 1. Another important point to know about the Smith chart, when we're working with impedance, R plus Jx, the right-hand side over here is the open. And you can see that it makes sense. This is 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, 1.8, 2.0, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So the further to the right we go, the higher the resistive portion and so this point right over here is the open. Conversely, we watch 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6. You can see it's progressing all the way over to the very far left-hand side, and that is the short. So that's with impedance. Well, you know, with admittance, things get all changed around because it is the inverse of impedance, we have G plus JB. So what was an open is now a short. And what was a short is now an open. Things swap. And that's a really important thing for us to know because this is the world that we're going to be working in when we do parallel stub matches. But we might ask, why do they swap places? Well, that's because when we translate ourselves over into the admittance realm, all of the values that we see on the Smith chart are now admittance values. Thus, this is a normalized admittance of 1.0. 
This is a normalized admittance of 2.0. The admittance is the inverse of impedance. And with admittance being the inverse of impedance, that means that if the impedance is equal to zero plus J zero, then the admittance is one divided by zero plus J zero, and one divided by zero is infinity when the impedance is zero. In other words, we have a short. The admittance is going to be infinity over here on the right-hand side. And when the impedance is infinity, in other words, we have an open. One divided by infinity is zero over on the left-hand side. So that's why in the admittance realm, once we translate over into admittance, the open is over on the left-hand side at the equator, and the short is over on the right-hand side at the equator. The next thing that we have to be concerned about is the direction in, of travel. Now, that has to do with these outer two rings out here. These outer two rings are in wavelengths, electrical length, of your transmission line. And so we have to be concerned with the electrical length that we are moving along the transmission line. Now from, from here all the way around 360 degrees back to the same place again is a half of a wavelength. And you might wonder why that is. Well, that is because if you have a piece of coax that has a particular impedance at one end of it, and it happens to be exactly one half wavelength long, electrically speaking, then it will have exactly the same impedance at the other end of that piece of coax. And that's why, because it, it's a repeating thing, every half wavelength, that's why we it only covers a half a wavelength. So to help you out a little bit, here is the equation to calculate the electrical length in wavelengths for a piece of transmission line of any description. You have the physical length of the coax. So you take out your tape measure, you measure that physical length. You multiply it by the frequency in hertz that you're interested in. And then you take that whole mass and then divide it by the speed of light times the velocity factor. Now be careful. If you are measuring your physical length in inches, then your speed of light must be in inches per second. If you're measuring it in feet, then your speed of light has to be measured in feet per second. Frequency is in hertz or cycles per second. And velocity factor has no dimensions at all. So this gives you the electrical length of your particular piece of coax. Now, if you're moving from the load, you know the impedance of the load, and you want to find out what that impedance is, or you want to transform that impedance to something else along the way as you're moving toward your signal source, your generator, your transmitter, then you are moving from the load toward the generator. And when you move from the load toward the generator, you're going to move around the Smith chart in the clockwise direction. Conversely, if you know the impedance here and you want to find out what it is downstream as you progress toward the load, then you want to move counterclockwise around the Smith chart. And a particular application for this would be if you had a, an antenna and you had a piece of, of feed line between your antenna all the way down in your shack and you had a, an antenna analyzer and you're measuring the impedance of your antenna through the transmission line using your antenna analyzer, and you wanted to know what the actual impedance of the antenna is. Well, if you know the length of the coax, you know the frequency that you're interested in, and you know the velocity factor of the coax, then 
you plot the impedance that you measured here with your antenna analyzer on the Smith chart. You draw your SWR circle using your compass, and then you follow that around the SWR circle, the number of wavelengths that your transmission line is, electrically speaking, and then you can read right off of the Smith chart what the impedance of your antenna is. Now we have one last thing that we have to look at. Observe what we see on this outer ring. Looking closely here, we see that we start out over on the right-hand side here at the equator at 0.25. And the next one is 0 0.26, 27, 28, and we continue on around. And we come over here, we have 0 0.48, we have 0 0.49, and then all of a sudden it goes to zero. Well, it would make sense that if this is 4.8, that's 4.9, then this would be 0 0.5. But it's also 0, 0.0 because it starts here and goes around to here to come to 0 0.25. So 0, 0.0 and 0 0.50 share the same spot on the Smith chart. And so there you have the long and the short of the tour of the Smith chart. Well, we're back at the tour bus station. You've had the opportunity to see all of the various basic parts of the Smith chart and what they're used for. This will go a long way to understand what we're doing in the next series of videos where I will be showing how to use the Smith chart to create a stub match. The first two of these will be a pencil and paper exercise only to demonstrate how to go about the process. In the third one, I will be creating a real stub match to match this lovely purposely bad load. At 100 megahertz, it sits at about a 5 to 1 SWR. And we will be creating a stub match so that we get pretty close to a 1 to 1 SWR even though we're starting out with something so bad. Now if you have found this video helpful please click on the like and subscribe to this channel. Until next time, thanks so much for watching. Toodaloots!